We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night question. Tonight, we're answering the question, what are some party games that hobby board gamers will enjoy? So now, longtime fans of the show are going to be aware that neither Sean, Deanna, or I are really big party game fans. Uh, most game nights were much more interested in playing about hour and a half long tactical and strategic games that cause a bit or a lot of brain burn. That said, we do occasionally enjoy a game night of lighter games, with these nights often being combined with a celebration like a birthday party or holiday like New Year's, or as part of long epic events like our Extra Life gaming marathons, where we can use a break from the brain burn and play some frivolous games. There's something to be said about a nice light party game early in an event, mm -hmm. especially if not everyone knows everyone else, to help break the ice. Then maybe again when everyone's neurons are smoking later <laughs> before heading home. Yeah, it's always nice to have that uh, aperitif before you end the night just to I want on before you go home. Now what this means is that the list tonight, our game recommendation to list tonight, is more a list of party games we actually enjoy that may not mash up with most party game lists out there or most best party game lists or most popular or even party game sales. While I know there are a ton of people out there that enjoy games like Cards Against Humanities, its clones and games by exploding kittens and uh, munch unicorns and bears and babies and lots of other kittens in a blender, all, all these very almost mass market party games, they just aren't really games we personally enjoy. Nothing against the people who do. Now, this could end up being, though, a great list of party games for hobby board gamers, which is where we took the question. The question tonight, instead of coming from one specific person, is actually like a combination of four different people asking us about party games, and I just figured we'll kind of lump them all together. As with any review show, we have our opinions, and that's all they are. If you find you enjoy our recommendations, great! But if you hate the games we suggest, well, it's valuable to know what, we, what to stay away from also. So before we get to our recommendations, I just want to take a very quick moment to talk about what we mean by party game. Now, personally, I think this one's pretty clear, but just in case anyone has any questions, to me, a party game is a game that's quick, easy to learn, plays a high player count, which to me means six or more, and most importantly, is more about the experience than the points. Party games are about having fun with other people and interacting and not worrying about winning and losing. Actually, many of the games we'll mention tonight, I never bother keeping score with when we're playing them, even though the games usually do include some system for doing so. So if you're hyper competitive, you've been warned if you're playing <laughs> at our table with a party game. Now on to our recommendations. As usual for these game recommendations list, the following games are in no particular order. Yeah, tonight they seem kind of more random than usual. And I, again, it was the idea, the 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 order they came into my head and then Deanna came in the room and I'm like, hey, what party games do we enjoy? So I ended up throwing a few more in there. And then I Googled a few lists. And and like I said, the we're not going to jive with the other lists out there. Um, actually, this seems to be a niche that no one else has really covered party games for gamers. So hopefully that'll work out well for us. And we'll be the people out there putting out the information for the first time. All right, first game I've got is Medium. Uh, this is the Psychic Connection board game, card game, I guess I should say card game, tabletop game, where you are going to get a hand of cards and they're going to have a bunch of words on them. And every player's got a hand and you're going to pair up with the player on your right, say, and you're each going to pick a card to play and you're going to say what's on that card out loud, like say, uh, canoe and biking. And then you're both going to look at each other. You're going to say the words out loud as you put them down. And then you're going to try and make a psychic connection. You go three, two, one, and you're going to say the medium, the word that's between those two. And I probably would say transport. And then someone else may say something other than transport, like uh, seats, because both have seats. I don't know. And you're like, oh, if we both got it right, we get points, lots of points. Again, I don't worry too much about the points, but you get points. If we get it wrong, we go again, but now we have to use the words we both use. So now I have to use transportation and seats. And I'm like, one, two, three, airplane. And then someone else is like, Banana. And I'm like, what? Banana? And then we have the whole party game thing where you go, why the heck did you say banana? And like, oh, I was thinking of a banana bike, the banana seat on a bike. And you keep going. You do this one more round if you don't have it, if you don't get it past the next player. And you just play a bunch of rounds until basically your deck runs out. There is, there is a kind of timing mechanism, so you don't know where and when exactly it ends. Uh, the great thing about medium is it plays very high player counts. Though I do recommend if you get like above six players, 
have two groups of players going at the same time. So like have one pair on one end of the table and another pair at the other end of the table going, because it can take a long time for your turn to go around, especially if players aren't very good, if they're not making the psychic connection. And no, I don't actually believe in the psychic connection thing. I'm sure there are people out there that do, but it's all about reading your friends. And I got to say, this one changes up so much based on who you play with. There, there is a huge factor of playing with good friends, playing with people you've known for years and playing with strangers. And I've actually made better connections with some strangers than I have with family. So, and th- th- that is medium, um, fantastic game. I, I, it is one I strongly recommend everyone have in their collection, really. Yeah, it's really interesting how the shared connections you expect sometimes mm-hmm. fail miserably, whereas just people who, you know, grew up in the same area as, as you might have less uh, preconceived notions about right. those shared experiences, which allows you to actually sort of meld a little bit better. And I think that's mm-hmm. what a lot of the time was happening. I haven't played this with a large group. I've only played it with the three of us. Um, but what about timing? I think... I guess timing on the, the timing mechanism in this game can kind of make it end a little early sometimes. Uh, do you recommend taking that out or or bumping it back for uh, larger groups? Uh, okay, so for larger groups, I found it was about perfect. The problem is the decks aren't made to handle like 12 player. I don't know what the box says for player count. You may have to add in extra decks. Uh, what we did find with large groups is just took a long time. And while it's engaging to watch two people do their thing, after a while you've watched multiple groups of two it's like okay is it gonna get back to my turn so that's why i recommend you do two rounds at once for just three players though low player clown i think you want to put in a couple extra decks because you're right it's over too quick though honestly what you could do too is just start a second game like like play the full round and then build a new deck with new cards that's always possible as well fair enough and that was medium All right, next up, I have one of my favorite party games of all time. I've got to thank my friend Jamie for introducing me to the fantastic Telestrations from the Odd. Now, we're going to be reviewing a 12-player version of Telestrations later in the show tonight. And for those of you listening to the podcast or just watching this segment, watch for that to come out on YouTube and on the blog. So Telestrations is Eat Poop You Cat, or the telephone game, done as a board game with drawing. So it's the whole you whisper something in someone's ear and then they whisper in someone's ear and they whisper in someone's ear. And when it gets back, you see if it matches. Well, you're doing that instead with drawings. Uh, Quite simply, you're going to get a clue from a card. You're going to write down the clue. You're going to pass your book. Person's going to draw what they read. Then they pass the book. Then you're going to look at the clue. You're going to look at what's written. You're going to draw it. And then draw, guess, draw, guess, draw, guess until the book gets back. Then you all laugh as you go through the book, trying to show how it went. And it doesn't usually come back around very often. And some of the transitions are utterly hilarious. I have literally laughed more playing Telestrations than any other game in my collection, any other party game. It is always uh, Rosh's fun. Absolutely. It's just a hilarious game to see, especially when you've got a good mix of drawing Mm -hmm. styles, because there isn't actually all that much of an advantage between a skilled artist and people who struggle with stick figures because timing is part of it. And a lot of times, the more you draw, the more you're distracting from the core Mm -hmm. of the clue you need to get across. Totally agree. And for Telestration fans, if you're not aware, there was a new 80s and 90s expansion just released uh, where you actually get 600 new words for Telestrations based on pop cultural references from the 80s and 90s. And again, we'll be talking about that later in the show, too. And that was Telestrations, including the 80s and 90s expansion. All right, next up, I got another game we're going to review tonight, and that is Hughes and Cues, also from the op. This is a game about guessing colors. You put out a big board with a big grid of colors on it, pretty much every color under the rainbow. Always makes me think I'm in Photoshop or paint whenever I see it. You got a score track at the top. Someone's going to give a cue. They grab a card. It's got four different colors on it. They pick one of the colors and then give a one word clue like pomegranate. And then people go to guess. And you got people thinking, well, does he mean the bright seeds or does he mean the kind of more purpley outer shell? So they place the guess and then it goes around. Everyone puts a guess on a color. And interestingly, only one clue on each color. Uh, Only one player can play on each color. And then it comes back to the clue giver and they're like, oh, okay, that wasn't close. I need more vibrant. So a cherry, I can't say red. I can't say cherry red. So uh, how about we'll just stick with pomegranate. We'll pomegranate juice. 
and they're like, oh, okay, so they're looking for a lighter color, and everyone puts a second guess, and then you get points based on how close you were. You get this little frame to put it out and get the points, but the whole thing is trying to guess a color based on a one-word clue, then a two-word clue. Getting points for how close you are with the clue giver, getting points for how many people were as close as possible. Yeah, and this is fantastic. But you also have to be careful because, again, much like we when talking about with Medium, shared experiences can be a big deal. Mm -hmm. It are the fire trucks in your city the same color as the fire yeah. trucks from someone else's city that you're playing with, for instance? Even in our own city, they were yellow for a while. They were vermilion for a while and then switched back to red. So I don't even know why, why but it was only a, a short period of time. So And in some cities, they're yellow, like yeah. bright yellow. So or chartreuse. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's, it's chartreuse. There's all sorts of uh, strangeness. See, I would have said fire truck vermilion and then that might have been someone that got it totally wrong. I mean, Barbie, uh, I know, is Pantone C219. Uh, yeah, is, see, is Barbie that, pink. But, you know, who else knows that? <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't get it. If you said Barbie, I'd probably go with blonde. That's, that's I'd probably go in the yellows aiming for blonde. All right. Well, that was Hughes and Cues. Next up, I've got code names, and I'm going to lump them both together. Code names, code names, duet, code names, Marvel, code names, Disney, code names, picture. They're all very similar. Uh, this is a word guessing, word association game where you're going to put up a grid of words and you are trying to get people to guess which cards you're referencing by giving a one word clue and a number. So you may say uh, Aunt May 3 to get someone to guess spider uh superhero and secret identity but then the person looks at it and they put their marker on venom and it ends up that it's actually a assassin and everyone loses now most of the games are team-based where you make a big group on one side and a big group on the other and you're giving clues to your own team but the duet version is actually a competitive or cooperative way to play where you're playing one team with another team, giving your own players clues. And I personally, of all of them, think Codenames Duet is the best version. No, many places are going to say it's a two-player game. That is incorrect. Um, nowhere on the box, nowhere in the rules does it say it's a two-player game, though the base rules as presented are two-player. For some reason, everyone seems to insist it's a two-player game. It is a two-team game that could have any number of players. Now, personally, I prefer Duet up to about six players. Once I get more than that, then I usually switch over to the basic code names. Another bonus of this game is all the clues can be combined. So you can just kind of mix and match everything and end up with like a massive second of code names cards. And if you want to give it a try, there are free online mm -hmm. versions of the game that can be great to play as well. That was the code names series of games. All right, my next one might break the rules a little bit because I did say that party games to me are quick, but to me, this feels like a party game, and that is the dexterity flicking game pitch car, where you build a wooden racetrack and you are flicking Crokinole-like Formula One cars around the track with some rules about which you can skip and knocking people off and reshooting and stuff like that. The thing with pitch cars, if you stick to just the base set, I think you can get a game done in the half an hour time limit or less. The problem is it's really hard to want to just stick with the base set and you're going to want to buy expansions and ramps and the loop the loop and the, the I don't even know, the hard banks and the crisscross and the figure eight and keep expanding the set. Now, one problem with pitch card that, it, that is always an issue is that the production quality is fantastic and the price is high to match. This is not a cheap game. It is pretty much all wood except for these rubber rails you can put in on some of the pieces and it has a price point to match. It is not a cheap game. But I love pitch car. I love playing it with the the higher player counts with eight, 12 cars, everyone getting in everyone else's ways and being able to bump into other people. And yes, when I generally play pitch car, I don't set up a quick, easy game. I tend to set up as complicated a track as I can. But you can, if you just stick to the originals, play a nice, quick game of pitch car. And one of the other issues with pitch car is space. Yes. Uh, if you, you need to not only have enough space to set up the track you want, but also to, to some maneuver around it to get at, at angles and things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so table heights, table sizes, there's a bunch of different varieties of ways of setting this up that you need to take into account, especially when you start getting in larger player counts and you need to think about people moving around each other to get in mm -hmm. there to play. 
while it can be fun, it can also be a logistical nightmare. Yeah. But when it works, that's a great game, and that is Pitch Car. Next, uh, I, possibly my favorite party game. It's it, uh, illustrations and concept are, are so close. This is concept, uh, a game that, that is unfortunately hard to describe and get the concept of unless you see it. Uh, basically, you've got a giant board. You can even buy a giant size version. You've got a pretty big board with a bunch of icons on it, right? Like like icons, like computer icon type of things. So a bunch of symbols all over the board. You're going to draw a clue from a card and you're going to pick it, pick one of the clues. And then you're going to try to get people to guess your clue by using the icons. And you have little plastic pieces to do this, like one for the main concept, another for sub concepts and little tiny cubes to kind of tie things together. And you are trying to use these icons to say, get someone to guess Rocky. So you might put like the concept is a person, a sub concept is a movie. You're going to put something on the, the, the ball baseball bat that means sports you're going to, there's like a fighting icon. You might put it on that. And all the other players are trying to guess what you're trying to put out there. I know there's rules for teams. The house rule we always play by is whoever guesses the clue first gets to be the next person to give the concept. And we've never kept score or kept track of how long we're playing. We just play it until we get sick of concept, which one night at Extra Life involved going through the entire deck of cards. Yeah, no, concept is fantastic. Uh, there's also a great uh, digital implementation on Board Game Geek. Uh, the concern... Board Game Arena. Board Game Arena, sorry. Uh, the concern I have had with it is that the actual clues sometimes are not as universal uh, and, and, and tend to be a little on the dated side yeah. with that game. Even though it's not actually that old, it's only a 2013 game, It the, the clues just felt a little dated. Uh, and yeah. that made it tougher for some people to really kind of uh, dig in. But that was... Yeah, I'll admit, yep. what I would like to see for concept is an updated... Like, just give me a card expansion. Yep. Give me a, a, a 2020 version concept card pack that I can replace. And I know there is a kid's version of concept now that's all about animals, but I don't know any more than that. Well, and there was a 2020 print and play that came out of concept, apparently. So I wonder if that might have I, I wonder... Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a COVID, uh, COVID release, so... Uh, okay. We'd have to definitely see what the uh, clues were like in that one. But overall, that was concept. Next, I have another Telestrations game that is not to be confused with the original because it actually plays quite different. That is Telestrations Upside Drawn. This is a team-based version of Telestrations where you're going to break into pairs, up to four pairs and eight players. And the difference in this one is everyone is trying to guess the same word one player is holding the marker. The other player is moving the board and trying to get the person holding the marker to guess the, 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 the clue, the word. It could be a phrase or whatever. Um, there, it's, it still uses a die to determine which categories you have, places, things, actions, and sayings, I think are the different ones. Um, this one's neat because there's more going on than you would expect. So in addition to the whole trying to draw by moving a board under someone else, which is its own, got its own issues. And the whole, some people have a hard time drawing upside down or not, or guessing upside down, depending on which way you go. Um, but the my part I really like in this is that it has a bit of a deduction element. And that's because you have to play all sitting in the same area where you can hear the other teams. So you've got this big triangle on your board and you start guessing uh, pyramid, uh, Egyptian, and then you hear someone else go Christmas tree. Oh, and then someone else like holidays. And I'm like, oh, wait. I know it's got to be about trees. So I'm like fir, spruce, forest. And then we win because we guess forest, even though I was originally thinking Egyptian, but I heard all the other teams were talking forest and trees and evergreens. So I thought maybe that's what it was. And I love it when that happens. And honestly, I will admit when I only played this with two pairs, I thought the game was neat. It was okay. And the, the drawing thing was a gimmick. But once we added up to six players and even more so with eight, it's that hearing the other team part that really makes this stand out as really interesting and cool. Right. So uh, as long as you have the opportunity to cheat off your other uh, players, it's <laughs> yes. a great game. It is definitely a much trickier dexterity based mm -hmm. game and has zero influence on whether or not you're a good drawer. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> and that is Telestrations Upside Drawn. Now this, I say this list isn't in order, but this comes next on purpose. The next game I have is Pictomania. 
This is a drawing party game um, based on Pictionary, which is why they, they did the pun on the name, by Vlada Shavado, of all people, like as someone who makes heavy Euro, heavily thematic Euro games. Well, he made this drawing game, and the thing that's great about this one is, again, it's about deduction. So what happens is you're going to put a clue up on a central board that everyone can see, and there are, say, eight things on it for eight players. Each player is drawing a different one of those things, and you all draw simultaneously. And while you're drawing, you're going to place bets on who you think is drawing the other things. And it's, again, got this kind of neat deduction thing because you're like, I know I'm drawing the duck. And D's obviously drawing the car, which leaves the tiger and the cat and the lion left. Okay, how the heck do I figure out? Wait, that's got stripes, so that's got to be the tiger. That leaves this. I can't tell at all what Genevieve's drawing, but I know the only thing left is this, so that's got to be it. And, like, there's to me, this is the gamer's drawing game. This is the, the drawing game for people who want the deduction element and the fact that, on, again, there's also strategy on not drawing too well. Because if you draw too well, you're going to get guessed out right away, but you still want to get guessed, but you don't want to eliminate it. So if you can draw your thing sort of like someone else's thing while getting yours across, that's part of the strategy. Of all the the drawing party games, to me, this is the one that, that Euro gamers are probably going to get a kick out of, which makes sense coming from Vlada. And uh, make sure you get you go for the second edition released in 2018. It does have a few improvements on it. That is Pictomania. Next, we get to another gamers game to me, a more of a gamers game, and that is Trap Words. Trap Words is <clears throat> what is um, what's the mass market game it's based on? Drawing a complete blank. You can't say the word. Uh... Oh. It's a gamer version of a very popular mass market party game that I can't remember the name of, and it's driving me nuts. But anyway, so the whole thing with Trap Words is it's got a cool fantasy adventure theme where you're moving through a dungeon trying to kill a boss monster. Thank you, Mountain Papa. Taboo, yes. yes sir. I'm like, Taboo is highly popular in mass market. Well, this is a gamer's version of Taboo. So you're going through a dungeon, and actually the theme is kind of tied in. There's some interesting stuff with curses and that. But in general, the thing is, is you are trying to get your team to guess a word. The problem is the other team is going to set a number of traps for you, which are words you cannot say while trying to get the other team to guess. The difference between trap words and taboo is in taboo, you know the words you're not allowed to say, and it's kind of like you get buzzed out if you say them. In trap words, the other team picks it, or you pick the traps for your opponents. So you're, there's got that, again, to me, the good party games have that, knowing who you're playing with has an impact. And that's where I found in trap words, it comes up a lot where you're like, well, I know Deanna is giving the clues. And if she's giving the clues for turtle, she might make a Xanth reference or whatever. A turtle. Yeah. Turtle and Xanth reference. I did get that right. Or Pratchett. Is Pratchett Xanth? Now I'm, now I'm messing things up. I'm like, this is what happens when we don't script our, our game descriptions before our episodes. But you're going to base your traps based on who you're playing with, which I think is fantastic. This one, I didn't know what to think when I first tried it. And I will admit we fumbled the first couple games because there's some very restrictive, unique rules about what you can give as clues and what you can't and who's allowed to say the trap words because the people guessing are allowed to use the trap words. And we messed that up the first game, which actually kind of ruined it. Uh, it's a neat game, worth learning, way more fun than I thought it was going to be. And again, good for gamers. And that was Trap Words. Which I got to kind of roundabout there. <laughs> Next, the oldest game on my list, sort of. Um, and that is The Great Dalmudi. The Great Dalmudi is a ladder climbing card game with 13 suits. Um, in this game, you are trying to void your hand of cards. And you're going to deal out the whole deck, no matter how many people are playing. And you're trying to get rid of all your cards. And the way it works is someone's going to lead and they're going to play a number of cards of the same number so they could play like 13 13s which would be ridiculous you'd never have that but they might start with like four 13s well the next player has to play a lower number but the same amount so they have to play four 12s would be going in logic but then the next player could play four sevens and then the next player could play four fours and four fours generally can't be beat but there are jokers and someone could play down two twos and two jokers and steal the trick and, and get rid of their cards 
Now, this game also has some very silly rules, and this is where it's firmly in the party game, is the two players who won the last trick get to be the great Dal Moody and the lesser Dal Moody, and at the other end, you have the lesser peon and the greater peon. Well, the peons have to give the Dal Moody's their greatest cards, and the Dal Moody's get to give any cards they want to their peons. So once you're in the great Dal Moody seat, you have a big advantage over everyone else. Everyone else are merchants and are allowed to trade one card, so they can all negotiate with each other and make deals. Then you throw in the fun rules, at least in my version of the game. I don't know about the new print thing, but in my version of the game, it suggests things like the peons are the ones who have to clear the cards every round and who have to count the tricks. The peons could also be the people who have to go get drinks for everyone, or the greater peon doesn't get a chair while they're playing. We have had a lot of fun with this. I realize it sounds kind of abusive, but as long as everyone's on the same page and having fun with it, I think it's really cool. Now, in recent history, and I don't know if it's this year, last year, or sometime before the pandemic started, because we're in quarantine, this game was re-released with a Dungeons and Dragons theme, where you are playing evil minions of some kind of overlord called the Dal Moody. I don't know if the humor is still in there, or if it's just mechanical. I have not checked out this new version. The version I have is from years and years ago from Richard Garfield, and my cards look like they've been well played. And I don't plan on replacing it. So I couldn't tell you if the D&D version is, includes things like abusing the peon or not. So a lot of people may know this game. You've probably been playing it in high school and for decades by many other names. Uh, P&A, uh, A-Hole. Uh, there's a lot of different names that this game has gone under. Uh, it's also been released as a Dilbert game yeah. for up to six players. Uh, and yeah, it was 2020, the Great Dal Moody Dungeons and Dragons was now, released. There is a big difference between the ones that use standard deck of cards, though, because you have 13 13s, 12 12s, 11 11s, 10-10s. You can't get that with a standard deck of cards. And that, to me, makes the big difference. I did not em em uh, enjoy President or A-Hole, whereas this I found better. There was more strategy to it. There was, I have six 13s. Do I spend two of them? For one suitor, I put all down all six, and do I save four for later? There was more tactics involved and a little more long-term strategy. Fair enough. It gave, it gave a big chance for the, the peons to actually replace the others by holding on to those low number or sorry, high number cards and high numbers of them. You could often steal a trick that should have been won by someone else. And that was the great Del Moody. Next, I have Nitwit. Um, still think I'm the only podcaster who ever talks about this game. This is the uh, the Venn diagram uh, party game where you're going to sit there and put a spool out on the board, and then you're going to put a rope around that spool, and you're going to draw a random word and attach it. Next player is going to put another spool out. Then they're going to put a rope around, but the rope has to go around at least one existing spool. You're going to keep doing this so that you have all these spools surrounded by various threads. Each of those threads has a number on it. Once this is done, everyone takes their, their little player card. You start the timer. Well, actually, there's no timer on this. It's first person done grabs a bonus coin. You, you, you basically say start the round, and then everyone looks at each spool and then writes down a word that fits everything that spool is looped by. So you could have you could have a green and I, I've drawn blanks so on I can't I can't improv tonight <laughs> green and slimy and someone might write frog and then someone else might write green eggs and ham or something and then once everyone's got down a an answer for every word you then go through it you there's a system for voting up or down if you think someone's on it or not like green eggs or ham that's not necessarily slimy. And then people argue over, well, no, I thought I think they were pretty slimy. And someone's like, well, I've got the book right here. They don't look that slimy. Then everyone votes if they go with green eggs and ham was legit or not. You get points for getting the most right. You play multiple rounds, player with the most points wins. This one reminds me even a bit of medium, but without that having to tie up, try, um, you know, match up with someone else. Yeah, no, this is definitely an interesting one. And, and it's strange. It's a 2016 game that really has not gotten a lot of public love out there, despite there being, uh, you know, it, it's a solid game. It's not, you know, super high, uh, highly rated, but uh, it's it's a nice, light, fun game that uh, is best at six players, which is, you know, what we look for a lot of the time in yeah. our party games. And that was Nitwit. Now, my final recommendation of games that we enjoy as gamers, party games that we enjoy as gamers who tend to enjoy heavier games, 
is the sadly long out of print, but wait, there's more. Uh, this is from the Bamboozle Brothers, Sen and Jay. This is one of my favorite games of all time. And I don't know why anyone won't reprint this game. I know Jay and Sen are up for it. So publishers, listen up. Get they, but wait, there's more out there. This is a pitch game. Uh, this is the best pitch game I've ever played, where you are going to get a product that is everyone's gets off the table. So everyone, you know, put a product out in the center of the table. Then everyone has a hand of features for that product. You're going to pick one of those features and you're going to start to pitch why people should buy that product with that feature. The thing is, 15 seconds or so into your pitch, you're going to say, but wait, there's more and flip over a random feature that you then have to integrate into your pitch. This goes around the table with everyone making their own pitch, all for the same product, but with different features. And then everyone blind votes on who they think gave the best pitch. Now, there is also a catch-up mechanic in this called Tell Me More, which if someone's, you know, doing a little too well and they seem to be struggling, you can play your But Tell Me More. And part of their But Wait, There's More, they then have to flip over yet another random card and add that into their pitch. This uh, game, I have to admit, is not for everyone. You have to be good at talking on your feet, which I'm obviously failing somewhat tonight. Uh, you got to be good at talking on your feet and improvising and coming up with stuff off the top of your head. But if you've got a group that can do that, you are going to love this. Where this game goes over best with my personal friends and group is with the role players I play with. You get the role players in there and then they get into their snake oil salesman mood and then they just hammer through this game. Yeah, I, I have to say this. I, I've played this one, uh, especially wonderful at like 2 a.m. on Extra Life <laughs> Nights. And it is a fantastic game. It's a shame that no one else has grabbed it since it's been out of publication and that is but wait there's more all right next i've got some honorable mentions now these are games that i don't personally own uh that i would be most likely to buy next like if i was going out shopping for party games this would be my short list starting with monstrosity yet another drawing game this one's unique to me though i haven't seen anything like this so you have a deck of monsters and the clue giver, we'll call it, I'm not sure what's called in the game, again, I don't own it, draws out a monster and then describes the monster to the rest of the players, and they sit and listen until the full description's done. Then everyone has to draw what was just described to them, but while doing so, they can ask the clue giver questions, like, oh, does it have a big nose or a small nose? You said its mouth is in its chest, like like up in its pecs or like in its belly, you know, and then at the end, you all show your monster and the one that's closest to the original wins the round and gets whatever points. Again, I don't even know what the scoring is in this game, because like most player games, most people throw that out. This one sounds fantastic to me. There's, I think, two now expansions giving you more monster cards, because I will admit that my one concern with this one is that you will get to know the monsters. And I'm worried that you're going to draw it and go, oh, remember the one with the 18 eyes? It's that one. And I, I, that would kind of ruin it. But again, I haven't played myself, and I think it's going to take a lot of plays before you get there anyway. Yeah, there are two. Uh, there's a Cute Creatures and a Robots expansion. Yeah. And apparently there are some alternative game modes involved in there, including some that can help you play with larger groups, uh, yeah. as well as if you just want to home rule it yourself, because that's totally workable as well. Uh, the Witness is the name of the uh, the person who's you know, looking at the drawings and looking judging at the monster and, and, and okay. seeing what's that. And that is monstrosity. Next, I have just one. Uh, I feel bad that I don't have this game yet. But to be honest, it came out in the middle of the pandemic and I'm not playing a lot of party games right now. So I haven't rushed to get it. Uh, this is one of the best sounding word guessing games where someone is you're, you're trying to get one player to guess the answer, the clue. Everyone else is going to provide clues to try to get that word guessed. And the whole thing in this game is if two players provide the same clue, they cancel each other out and they don't get to share it. If everyone's clues cancel everyone out, the guessing person basically has no information to work on. This just sounds fantastic. Excuse me. This just sounds fantastic. I have not heard anyone say anything bad about this game. It seems like a great big group game. Uh, it's honestly on my list to pick up. Once we get back to playing in public big gaming events, I'm going to try to find myself a copy of Just One. So Just One is ranked number three in party games. 
yeah. on Board Game Geek. Although it did come out a little bit before the pandemic by two years. So uh, okay, <laughs> but that was just one. If I remember, it was impossible to get when it first came out. I think that's what I remember. Anyway, I still don't have a cop. Got to go with it. Next up, I have the pitch game I'm most curious about now that you can't get, but wait, there's more. I already own everything there is for, but wait, there's more. So the next pitch game I have, this one's from Bicycle, the company that makes playing cards, and that is Tattoo Stories. This is one where you have to draw a tattoo based on a pitch, and then you have to sell how your tattoo matches the story it's supposed to tie to. I will admit, again, I don't own this one, but I love the concept of drawing tattoo style art into your pitch and the combination of drawing and pitching in one. To me, that just sounds really cool. Yeah, unfortunately, this game has not gotten a lot of press. And I think a lot of people see the publisher or 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 the publisher isn't getting into the right game stores because it hasn't gotten the yeah. interest that I think, at least from reading the box, and again, I haven't played this one either, but I've been really intrigued every time I've read about this mm -hmm. game. Uh, and it's just not gotten any sort of market penetration oh, uh, for what sounds like a great game, but that is tattoo stories so that's it for our list of party games wow. that we personally enjoy and think will be enjoyed by hobby board gamers there we go we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions if you've got a question for us head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on ask the bellhop fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where i can be found as tabletopbellhop one word